So uh, thank you very much um, for the kind introduction and thank you very much for having me. It's a real pleasure to be virtually in Germany and uh, to be presenting to you my um, recent research. Um, very generally, I'm interested in why individuals are nice with each other, why they help each other. And it's not only humans who are cooperative. Um, actually, cooperation is very widespread among the animal kingdom. So we see, for instance, fish um, co cooperatively breeding, where they care for the eggs of others. Um, birds mobbing away predators together. Uh, also, our closest living relatives, chimpanzees, who are engaging in collaboratively uh, collaborative hunting. And probably the prime example of cooperation in the animal kingdom are you socially and so, where some individuals forgo their own reproduction in order to help few raising their offspring. And if we try to summarize this variety of behavior, we can say one individual benefits another one or one individual helps another one. And what is quite interesting is the evolution of such behaviors. And when we study the evolution of cooperative behaviors, we make an important distinction. So some of those behaviors are immediately beneficial for all involved parties. So in the case of the chimpanzees, for instance, it's in their interest to hunt as a group because only in a group they're able to bring down large prey, which they wouldn't be able if they would be hunting alone. And because they are then afterwards also receiving pieces of the uh, prey, it's in their interest to share this cooperative behavior and the evolution is relatively straightforward. You should always perform an action that is beneficial to yourself. However, there are also other behaviors that are immediately beneficial only for recipients of a cooperative act. And those are a bit more challenging to understand. So in other words, why should this fish, for instance, care for the eggs of a more dominant individual over there? And in fact, already Darwin struggled with those behaviors and considered them to be a major threat to his whole theory of natural selection. Because he predicted that selection should favor those that outcompete others and not those that help others and provide benefits to, uh, to potential competitors. Many years after uh, um, Darwin, um, Hamilton proposed a theory and a possible solution to this dilemma, which is called the kin selection theory. So here we might observe that one individual helps or benefits a second one. And then because of that help, the latter one is therefore able to reproduce more often or better. And because the helper and the recipient of help share some genes, it's in the interest of the helper to help because he or she transmits indirectly genes to the next generation by helping a relative. So this is a very neat theory. However, it falls short when we try to explain cooperative behaviors between unrelated individuals. However, we know that cooperation takes place very frequently also between non-kin. Think about all our business relationships, how we treat strangers, friendships, et cetera. And probably the most extreme example is when individuals of two different species come together in order to cooperate or help each other. And this here is, for instance, a cleaner fish cleaning the surface of this, more, um, of this bigger client fish. So how can we explain those behaviors? Well, a few late years after Hamilton, Robert Trivers proposed the theory of reciprocity. And so here we might observe that one individual helps another one, and then later on, the previous recipient of help reciprocates or pays back the favor. So both pay some costs in order to help each other, but they also receive benefits of receiving help and this is especially important when you're in great need and need some food, for instance. And so those individuals who help each other repeatedly are better off than those who never help, but also never receive any help by others. Reciprocity is omnipresent in humans. We reciprocate on a daily basis. It might not always be that obvious because we're using money in between, but reciprocity is really present daily. We also start reciprocating very early on in ontogeny. Kids from three years onwards reliably reciprocate with each other, and that suggests that it's maybe an ancient uh, skill. 
Something that I always find quite funny is that economics sometimes refer to humans as homo reciprocan, obviously not to replace homo sapien, but to illustrate how important reciprocity is in all our cooperative decisions, in our trade markets, etc. So now that we know that reciprocity is so important for us, how about other animals? Well, after Trevis proposed his theory, we saw a rise of reciprocity also in the animal kingdom. It was considered to be a key concept in behavioral ecology, and there were various examples for reciprocity. Vampire bats shared blood with each other according to reciprocity. Sticklebacks took turns when inspecting predators. And various animals were shown to groom each other according to reciprocal rules. Today, I think we face a very different situation. We face a fall of reciprocity. Quite famous researchers are asking questions like, why is reciprocity so rare in social animals and therefore assume that although it's present in humans, it's very rare or even absent in other animals and that reciprocity might be a uniquely human trait. Others consider non-kin cooperation so rare that we don't even need theories to explain it because kin selection is more prominent. And there is a whole bunch of literature trying to explain why reciprocity is so rare in animals, but not in humans. So when I went deeper into the literature, trying to understand what's the problem with reciprocity, why are people so skeptical about this? I identify three main sources of skepticism. One is that many people believe that reciprocity is so cognitively challenging that only humans are able to do so. Second, some people think that kinship is more important than reciprocity and can explain most or almost all cooperative behaviors. And finally, many people think that there is a lack of evidence. After Trivers proposed his theory in the 70s, People think that all the evidence that we have seen can be criticized and it's not very convincing. So the aim of this talk today is to first talk a little bit about how cognitively challenging is reciprocity? Is kinship really more important than reciprocity? What about the perceived lack of evidence? Is there one and what can we do about it? And this part is mainly based on my work on rodents. And then in the second part, I will return to our human forms of reciprocity and what are the evolutionary origins of those. And then I will talk briefly about the psychological origins of reciprocity. Let's start with the first part. So I've worked a lot on Norway rats, which are the rats that you will encounter if you see a rat outside in most of the cases. Rats are highly social animals. They live in large social groups of up to 250 animals, depending on um, how much food there is available. And they live in these underground burrow systems and share uh, food with each other, huddle together, etc. Important for all of my studies is that rats are super tolerant around food. They share high quality food like meat or eggs, but also low quality food like fruit or veg with each other. We can bring those rats to the lab and study how and why they are sharing food with each other. And rats are nocturnal animals, so they are mainly active during, um, during the night, which we simulate in our labs. So we work with them under red lights. So we basically switch their light cycle. So during our day, it's dark for them. And during our night, we switch on the bright light. And because they can't see red as a color, we switch on the red light. And so that's why the video might look a bit weird. So this is how we are studying food sharing behavior in rats. What you see is here an experimental cage that is divided into two chamber with one rat each. And in front of this experimental cage, there is a movable platform connected to a stick. And on the other side of the platform, um, there is a food reward. In this case, it's an oat flake. And what you will see is that by pulling the stick, the whole platform moves into the experimental cage and provides food only to the recipient. We can then afterwards reverse the rules and ask the previous recipient of help, would you like to reciprocate? Would you like to pay back the favor? And as you see, they're happy to do so. 
So let's return to the question of how cognitively challenging reciprocity is. First, I would like to illustrate what's the problem with reciprocity. So imagine you are this rat in the middle and you meet another rat who provides help to you, for instance, by providing you with food. All you need to memorize is food received or cooperation or whatever. It gets more complicated if you now meet a second partner. Now you need to individually recognize A as A and B as B, and you need to tag A as a cooperator and B as a defector. This obviously gets more and more complicated the more partners you meet during lifetime. And to make things slightly worse, we humans rarely encounter um, other humans who are only cooperative or only uncooperative. And the same might be true for rats as well. So they might meet a partner over multiple encounters. And so they differ in their cooperative experiences. So maybe they were cooperative on one or two days, but then uncooperative on another day. So you see that there's a lot of information that needs to be stored in order to reciprocate appropriately. So therefore I asked, do rats integrate several experiences with a partner or is there a cognitively less demanding strategy? I made use of exactly the same food sharing paradigm that you have seen in the little video clip, and my rats experienced one partner over several days. On day one, the partner was providing food as on day two and three, but on day four, I blocked the platform. So this partner was overall cooperative and just failed to cooperate once. And then 24 hours later, I reversed the roles and the focal rat could provide food to this partner. I compared this to a second partner that was uncooperative on day one, two, and three, but cooperated on the last day. And I then compared this to partners that were only experienced once, once as a cooperator and once as a defector. And so I predicted that if rats use a cognitively less demanding strategy by only considering the last move of a partner, which is characteristic for a tit for tat like strategy, they should provide food more often to a partner that was overall uncooperative and only cooperated on the last day, and that there should be no difference between a partner that was only experienced once compared to several times. If rats are, however, able to integrate um, the information of multiple encounters, they should help partners more often that also cooperated more often. And these are the results. So on the y-axis, you see how many old flakes focal rats provided to partners that were experienced once, once as a cooperator and once as a defector. And as you see, the line goes down, so they are reciprocating by providing food more often to cooperators compared to defectors. Here comes the interesting part. This is the behavior towards a partner that were overall uncooperative and cooperated on the last day, compared to overall cooperative partners that defected on the last day. So that suggests that they are mostly relying on the last encounter with a partner. And so cognitive demands can be lowered actually. Reds store fewer information by only um, memorizing the last encounter with a partner, which might be more common in other animals potentially. What about kinship? So there is this general assumption that reciprocity is only important for unrelated individuals. So it's basically like as soon as relatives are interacting with each other, you can explain all their behavior by kin selection and only in the rare cases where unrelated, totally unrelated individuals interact with each other, that that's when we need reciprocity. In fact, we simply don't know this. We don't know it because Studies on reciprocity usually avoid testing related individuals because that might be a confounding factor for those studies. And studies on kin selection obviously avoid the potential to reciprocate because again, that might be a confounding factor. And so in this project, I ask, are nepotism and reciprocity mutually exclusive mechanisms or can they happen at the same time? And so for this, I took rats after weaning and put them into different cages so that they had siblings in our colony, but they had no direct interactions with our siblings 
for a really long time. So I waited for 16 months, which is quite a long time, correct? Before I then conducted the experiment. In the experiment, the rats experienced an unrelated cooperators and unrelated defectors before they could repay or reciprocate. And they also met related cooperators and related defectors. I had a bunch of predictions here. So if you predict that reciprocity and nepotism or kin selection are two mutually exclusive mechanisms, you could predict that relatives indicated in the dash line, no matter what they do, they always receive a lot of help. And only for unrelated partners, it matters whether they've helped. However, it might be that reciprocity overrides kin selection in this situation, so that we don't find any differences between relatives or unrelated individuals because refs only consider the last experience with a partner. Or you could predict that those effects are additive. So in such a situation that rats reciprocate with both kin and non-kin, but kin overall receive more help because of indirect benefit. These are the results. So you see that cooperative partners received always more help than defecting partners. Interestingly for us, and that was even significant, is that unrelated partners in the, in the dash line received more help than related individuals, which was quite unexpected for us. So what do we take from this? Well, I think it's really important to recognize that kin and non-kin can reciprocate for donation. Just because individuals are related, that does not mean that that's the end of the story, but reciprocity can take place also between relatives. Why did related rats donate less food to each other then? Well, um, we think that it might be important to invest in relationships outside of your relatives. We do see that sometimes in humans, we invest more in individuals who are unrelated. We call them friends in humans. And we do that because it's important to build up a big network so that when we are in need, relatives will anyway help us, but we might need additional help by friends. And that was also seen in vampire vets. And so those vampire vets with a lot of friends outside their family bonds were better off when they starved one night and were more likely to receive help. Overall, however, I would say the take home message from this part is reciprocity can take place between both kin and non-kin. And we should not underestimate the importance of reciprocity by limiting those interactions to unrelated individuals. What about the perceived lack of evidence? So many people or many papers also start with sentences like, despite many years of research, there's not enough evidence for reciprocity. First, I would like to highlight that there is evidence for reciprocity. The results on vampire vets have been multiple, multiple times criticized but Jerry Carter followed up with a lot of experiments, both in the wild and in captivity, and showed that they do reciprocate food donation. Birds help each other. For instance, ravens support each other during fights according to reciprocity. Fish reciprocate. So these fish, for instance, they feed in diets. And while one is vigilantly scanning the environment, one is feeding, and then they take turns in those roles. Worms can show reciprocity. This is one of my favorite examples. So these are hermaphrodite worms. And when they meet each other, um, both want to be males because you can sire more offspring. But if all are males, you know, it won't work. What they do is one lays one egg, the other one fertilizes this egg, then this one lays an egg, the other one fertilizes. And it's beautiful reciprocation. And finally, even bacteria have been shown to reciprocally um, exchange molecules. So it seems that there is evidence across the animal kingdom. What's the problem with this evidence? It's not that those people don't read those papers, but they criticize them. They think they are not convincing for a couple of reasons. One reason is that most causally relevant experimental studies make use of our rather artificial testing setups, like my rat study. So you are unlikely to encounter rats in the wild sharing food with each other by pulling little platforms to each other. So we 
at, at this point, we don't know how biologically relevant those studies are. Those researchers who go out to the field and study very biologically that relevant behaviors, they very often can only come up with correlational evidence, and we don't know whether the correlation is caused by causality. And to make things slightly worse, even if we find such correlations, um, very often in another population or in another data set, there is not there is no evidence for reciprocity, so there is mixed findings. I think that those mixed findings might be a result of one standard assumption, and that means that reciprocity means paying like with like, food for food, allo grooming for allo grooming, etc. However, and especially if you only have a rather limited sample size, you might be unable to detect a reciprocal relationship when you're only focusing on one commodity. But in fact, it might be that your individual has reciprocated received telegrooming already with food or support, and then you can't find a reciprocal relationship when you're only focused on allogrooming. Well, I'm not the first one who had this idea. But many people say, OK, well, this is really cognitively demanding because you actually need a concept of value. So in other words, how often do you need to groom a partner who pointed out that there is a predator right behind you and potentially has saved your life? So in this project, I basically wanted to kill three birds with one stone. So first, I wanted to develop a tool set to manipulate naturally occurring behaviors and therefore bridge the gap between causally, uh, causal experimental studies and biologically relevant studies. I then wanted to validate the most common testing setup, which is the bar pulling pa paradigm, in order to understand whether studies with, with those setups can result in meaningful results and finally, I wanted to test whether rats are able to trade different commodities with each other. So I knew that rats are readily able to uh, share food with each other, but do they also exchange another commodity? The most common pro-social behavior that rats show is allogrooming, and they preferably groom each other at spots that are difficult to reach, like the neck region. And so that in this experiment, I basically experimentally manipulated their grooming behavior. So what I did was I split up the experience phase into two stages. In the first stage, the folk rat and its partner were separated from one another, whereas in the second stage, they could freely interact. And in order to induce grooming, I applied salt water on the partner's neck. I used salt water in a really disgusting concentration that the rats really hated. And I used this because I knew that, they, that um, the rat would appreciate being groomed, appreciate being helped. I could have also used honey, but then I wouldn't be sure whether the folk rat would have preferred to keep all the honey to herself. So then in the test phase, I reversed the roles and applied salt water on the partner's neck. And then I compared this to a situation where I applied salt water in the closed phase. So therefore I had lower grooming rates in this phase compared to this phase. And of course the different stages were all counterbalanced. And I then noted down how often did the folk red groom one and the same partner in the test phase that showed once enhanced grooming levels and once only baseline grooming. And these are the results. Again, you see that rats groom partners more often than groomed them in the past. And I used rats that were in the hierarchy, like middle rankers, so to say, and they showed reciprocity towards subordinates. And they also showed reciprocity towards dominance, although dominance received slightly more grooming than subordinates. So these results show that rats also groom each other reciprocally. And that was a really important finding because that showed that rats also use biologically relevant behavior when exchanging help with each other. And this is also based on reciprocity. Important is also to note that grooming is a very widespread um, behavior. We see it from invertebrates like ants up to primates. And this is a uh, setup that can be easily applied to all kinds of animals. And so this is a good protocol in order to study the cause relationship between received and given help in a biologically relevant commodity. 
So that was the first check. So what about the, sec uh, the, the other two aims? So probably not surprising now, I mix grooming and food sharing. And so the, the focal rat experienced the partner in four different situations. Once as a cooperative groomer, as an uncooperative groomer, as a cooperative food provider, and as an uncooperative food provider. And then later on, the focal rat could repay, could reciprocate by using the other commodity. These are the results. On the y-axis, you see how often focal rats groomed a cooperating food provider or a defecting non-food provider. And each line represents the behavior of one focal rat towards one and the same partner. And as most of the lines go down, you see that they do reciprocate food for our groom. And that was also the case in the reverse situation. So this result showed that although artificial, those food, um, um, those seemingly artificial food donation tasks can be translated into biologically relevant behaviors, and therefore we should not reject results on those artificial testing setups prematurely because they might be translated into biologically relevant behaviors. It also showed that rats are able to trade different commodities and maybe they don't need a concept of value. And so when we go out to study animals in their natural environment, we need to make sure that we encounter and that we measure all different commodities in order to understand whether there is a reciprocal relationship in received and given health. And so as a take home message, reciprocity might be wildly underestimated in the field by not considering those aspects. So we've now talked a lot about rats. What about the evolutionary origins of our human form of reciprocity? So humans evolved, they, they did not fall from the moon, we evolved like all other species on this planet. And the question is now, is reciprocity so uniquely human? Did it in, evolve in our lineage or is it maybe shared with other animals and then therefore evolved way earlier? And so the, the obvious candidate to look out for this is non-human primates because they're our closest living relatives. And if we find reciprocity in those in the, uh, species, we might suggest that reciprocity has evolved in a last common ancestor. However, many people think that there is only limited evidence for reciprocity in them. So I conducted a literature survey asking, is there really no good evidence for reciprocity in non-human primates? And so I identified a bit more than 30 experimental studies on non-human primates and roughly 200 observational studies looking at reciprocity in roughly 40 non-human primate species. When we now ask the very basic question, first for the observational studies, how many of those studies now show ev um, evidence for reciprocity? Then what we see is that the majority shows evidence for reciprocity. So, well, that might be driven by a publication bias, so that people are more likely to publish significant findings. However, there are a couple of meta-analyses that looked at subsets, like for instance, only grooming for grooming or support for support. And all of those meta-analyses can control for publication biases. And despite controlling for it, all of them found evidence for reciprocity. However, we don't know whether those correlations are based basically uh, the result of reciprocity or correlations between received and given help are based on proximity, kinship, or whatever. So what we need is um, experimental evidence. How does it look like for the experimental study? Well, it actually looks quite similar, just with a way smaller sample size. So the majority of those studies actually provide evidence for reciprocity. So what does that mean? So first of all, I think it's important to notice that there is evidence for reciprocity in our closest living relatives. And that might be a good opportunity to explore whether our reciprocity is very similar or very different to the forms of reciprocity that we find in our closest living relatives. I also find those negative findings or seemingly negative findings very interesting because I think they provide a fantastic opportunity to explore the parameter space of reciprocity. What do I mean with that? 
I think that reciprocity is more or less important under some circumstances. And because all of those studies differ in various aspects from each other, we can explore under which conditions reciprocity is more likely to be shown than in others. And so these studies differ, for instance, in commodity characteristics. Are we looking at food sharing, support, grooming, or whatever? Are we looking at related or unrelated individuals? Are they choosing partners to cooperate with, or are they forced to interact with a certain partner and need to punish them, for instance, for, for not cooperating? Are we looking at strangers or close friends or in-group, out-group members? What about the time frame? Are we looking at reciprocity in a very short time frame, like turn taking, or within a couple of seconds, minutes, or even months and years, etc.? And so I will illustrate this by looking at commodity characteristics for a moment. So there is this general assumption that I also shared for a very long, long time that the choice of commodity should not really matter. All what matters is the value. As long as the value of help is more or less the same, it doesn't matter whether you are exchanging support or other grooming or food. So when we look at the experimental studies, what is quite apparent here indicated in blue is that most of the studies look at food sharing behavior. And so this is for obvious reasons, because you know that your participants are motivated to take part, and you can easily portion it, et cetera, et cetera. But the more I started thinking about food sharing, I thought that's actually a very peculiar commodity. Food is the only commodity that can be owned. You can't own allegory, you can't own support. And because food can be owned, many primates show loss aversion. So they are inclined to give away something that they've already possessed. And also many primates show a respect for ownership. So after working with, I started working with chimpanzees and you see two of them here. So this is Brian and this is Roxy over there. And Brian is holding an enchima ball, which is something to eat. And Roxy is hungry and she would really like to have something, but she would never dare to just grab it because Brian is the possessor of this food. Instead, what she did was she begged and then Brian dropped something for her. Overall, however, food sharing is not very common among non-human primates. Only roughly 20 species, which is 10% of the non-human primates, show food sharing outside the mother offspring um, situation. And if it happens, it's mostly passive. Brian dropped something. He didn't just hand over it to Roxy, which stands in contrast to most of the experimental studies. So let's focus again on the observational uh, studies first and ask the very basic question, how likely is it that studies result in evidence for reciprocity when they look at food exchanges or non-food exchanges? First, what you see is a very obvious pattern that most of the studies look at non-food um, sorry, non-food exchanges, which is obvious because it's just not very, um, um, very common uh, in, in non-human primates. And those that looked at food exchanges actually didn't find a very convincing pattern. These are the results for the experimental studies. Although the sample size is obviously very small, I find it quite interesting that all of the studies to date that looked at non-food exchanges resulted in evidence for reciprocity. So it might matter what kind of commodity we are studying in order to find evidence for reciprocity. And I think we should work on a more revised and comprehensive theory of reciprocity to understand more under which circumstances reciprocity is actually important. I would now like to talk very briefly about the psychological origins of reciprocity. So in my studies on rats showed that at least rats don't use very complicated calculations. They don't calculate how much received did I, uh, how much help did I receive, of what value, how much do I need to return, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So reciprocity does not need to be um, cognitively demanding. But if they don't make such calculations, how do they actually do it? And I think if we understand more about the psychological origins, we will be able to identify different forms of reciprocity. 
it's important that reciprocity is an umbrella term. Reciprocity just describes that received and given help has something to do with each other, but you can come up with this correlation in different ways. Now I identified at least three different decision rules that animals use and at least four different prox proximate mechanisms that can be used in order to reciprocate. And so I don't want you to memorize this horrible table. All I want to show you is that there are different forms of reciprocity and they vary in co co uh, cognitive complexity. And so the, how worms are, for instance, reciprocating might be very different to how we are reciprocating with business partners. We might even see different reciprocity forms in humans. It's different how we are reciprocating help with friends or with business partners, for instance. And so I really truly believe that the question should not be, does reciprocity exist, but how does it work? And this is what we are currently working on in my lab. With this, I would like to thank you for listening uh, thank you for the, uh, for the support from the funding agencies. And of course, I would like to thank my wonderful collaborators, supervisors, mentors, colleagues, students, all this would have not been possible without all of those people. Thank you very much.